particular order, I'll present a few of the problems in the Bible that have perplexed me for many, many years. In Hebrews 11:34, some hero of faith, presumably Joshua, was commended for putting to flight the armies of the alien. Proverbs 3.30 warns us against picking fights with those who have done us no harm. The book of Joshua clearly describes how the Israelites were aggressive invaders fighting to take over other people's land. And during this campaign, a vast campaign of genocide was carried out and many bloody massacres followed. Aliens are, by definition, people who are born outside of the land, and the people the Israelites waged a war of conquest against were the native inhabitants. Strangely enough, I found several scripture references in the Old Testament where God exhorts the Israelites to be kind to the strangers or non-Israelites in the land and not to oppress them. So I find this to be a contradiction to turn around and massacre them. That's not being kind to the stranger in the land. And how does Joshua's conquest of the promised land square with the teachings of Jesus? Christ taught love, not aggression toward neighbors. Whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye also unto them. Luke 6.31 Paul stated that Old Testament scriptures were written for our warning and instruction in righteousness. But nowhere does Jesus ever teach his people to wage wars of conquest like Joshua. Throughout the New Testament, Believers are exhorted to be gentle and peaceful toward all. In Luke 9:52 through 56, when his disciples urged Jesus to follow Elijah's example and nuke an inhospitable Samaritan village, Jesus said, I came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them. In 1 Samuel 15, 2 through 6, God commands the Israelites to wipe out the Amalekites in a genocidal bloodbath, but to spare the Canaanites. Why this preferential treatment? Verse 6 says, For ye, the Canaanites, showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. Obviously, the Amalekites weren't that nice to the Israelites, so they had to go. In Deuteronomy 23, Three through six, God tells the Israelites how to deal with the Ammonites and Moabites. They are not allowed to come into the congregation of the Lord forever until the tenth generation. Well, that word forever would in itself or open up a whole new subject. A lot of preachers say forever always means eternity. Well, what about when they reach the 11th generation? Does that mean the Ammonites and Moabites waited for all eternity to enter into the congregation of the Lord? Well, back to our main point. Why was God so upset with these people? Verse 4, because they met you not with bread and water in the way when the Israelites came out of Egypt. So they didn't show them hospitality. And because they hired a sorcerer to curse the children of Israel. And in verse 6 it says that the Israelites shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all their days forever. Well how does this square with Jesus teaching in the New Testament to bless your enemies and to do good to those who do evil to you? I see a clear contradiction here, especially in the light of the fact that Scripture says that God does not change. He is the same forever. One problem book is the book of Esther. And for many centuries, both the Jews and the Christians hotly debated 
on whether to include Esther in their canon of scripture. Well, it, there came a point in history in the Middle Ages where the Jews thought it was a good idea to include Esther because it built up their prestige as a nation and made them feel good about themselves. So when they accepted it, the Christians decided to also. Problem with the book of Esther is it's a book about bloody vengeance that is carried out upon not only their enemies, but the families of their enemies. There is no mention of God in this book. What was Jesus' attitude toward how to deal with enemies? He says in Matthew 5:43, You have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute or greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Jesus indicates that in sending rain upon both the just and the unjust, God is being impartial in blessing people here on earth, and that's his policy of how to treat them. But the bloody genocides of the Old Testament indicates partiality. Notice in verse 43 of the aforementioned scripture passage, Jesus says, It has been said, instead of my father commanded, but if kindly forbearance is God's own policy toward his own enemies, one he expects his own children to follow, why all the bloody vengeance, massacres, and genocide in the Old Testament? If God expects Christians to be gracious toward their own persecutors, why did he repeatedly have blasphemers and Sabbath breakers stoned to death in the Old Testament? Everyone is familiar with the story of the martyr Stephen in Acts 7. Before Stephen dies from the brutal stoning he has just endured, Stephen asks God to forgive his persecutors. But some other righteous man in Second Chronicles chapter 24, Zechariah, dies a similar martyr's death by stoning at the king's commandment. Instead of offering free forgiveness, his dying wish is that God would require his blood of his murderers. Likewise, in Revelation 6.10, the spirits of martyred saints plead for God to avenge them. Both Stephen and Zechariah were servants of God led by the Spirit, and Zechariah's desire for justice was endorsed by Jesus in Matthew 23.35. So why does Stephen feel obligated to forgive unrepentant murderers while Zechariah clearly does not. Another thorny issue, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. 1 Peter 2, 13-15. Here Peter states no exceptions to this commandment, assuming it really was the real Simon Peter who penned this verse. Apparently Peter did just the opposite back in Acts 5:29 when he said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Submit to every ordinance of man, even unjust or barbaric laws. One of the most unjust laws in American history was the Fugitive Slave Law of the mid-1800s. This statute required the extradition of escaped slaves from the free states back to their owners in the South some of whom were evil and sadistic. By the way, the Fugitive Slave Law broke a law in Deuteronomy 23.15 which prohibits forcing 
the return of escaped slaves, but no respectable white southern preacher ever bothered to bring that minor point up. Paul the Apostle knew the Mosaic Law better perhaps than any Christian living today. But in the book of Philemon, we have the story of Onesimus, an escaped slave. Paul converts Onesimus to Christianity and strongly exhorts him to return to his master Philemon. Genesis chapter 16 tells the story of Hagar, the slave girl of Sarah. After being forced to have sex with her master Abraham in order to provide a son for him, Hagar gets pregnant and pretends to be proud of it just to protect her dignity. So Sarah punishes Hagar for insolence. She beats the defenseless Hagar so badly that Hagar fears for her life and that of her unborn child. Hagar flees. God sends an angel to make Hagar go back into that lion's den of cruelty. So God did force a slave to go back to the master. Southern slave owners loved to quote that story and forgot all about God's commandment not to make the slave go back. The novel Uncle Tom's Cabin addresses this very issue. Eliza, a young slave woman, discovers that her master has sold her four-year-old son to a trader who would take him away the next morning. That man would most likely sell him in New Orleans to shady pimps who would ruin him spiritually and morally. Eliza, a devout Christian, fled with little Harry in the dead of night toward the Ohio River. With no other way to get across, Eliza skipped across melting ice blocks in the river to get to the other side. Assisted by kindly folks who had the courage to break an unjust law, she eventually reached Canada. Protecting the soul of her child took priority over obeying every ordinance of man. Paul exhorted slaves to obey their masters and please them in all things without any protest. Titus 2.9 What if the master commanded a godly slave to poison an unwelcome dinner guest or commit fornication as Joseph's mistress ordered Joseph to do in Genesis 39.7? In Uncle Tom's cabin, Tom, a devout Christian, refuses to whip a cotton picker who was too sick and weak to meet her quota for the day. In Titus 2.9, Paul commanded Christian slaves to please their earthly masters in all things. Well, what if some wicked master commanded his male slave to force himself on all the female slaves so they could make babies for him to sell? Now, that would be a wicked thing to command the poor slave to do, and if the slave refused to do it out of scruples of conscience, he would be failing to please his earthly master, wouldn't he? So he'd be breaking that commandment, and so would a female slave be breaking that commandment if the master tried to sell that female slave into a brothel to earn money off of her, but the girl ran away to avoid having to live like that. She would be disobeying that command to please her master well in all things, because I doubt that that wicked master would be pleased about it. Just about all of the slave owners of the Apostle Paul's day came from the respectable, moneyed, upper crust, eminent gentlemen of society who would, to prejudiced eyes, seem worthy of obedience and deferential treatment. But one excellent example in Uncle Tom's cabin was an argument put forth by Eliza's husband, who was also fleeing slavery. It may be true that the Bible commands Christians to abide in that state in which they find themselves and be content with it. But what if a white settler were kidnapped by an Indian and forced to hold corn for that Indian the rest of his life? Wouldn't that white man see it as God's divine intervention if a horse 
came by to carry him away from his life of bondage? Paradoxically, Paul also commands Christians not to be the servants of man because they are bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 7.23 Now the very definition of a servant is someone who serves, and the recipient of that service is the one that you serve. And if Paul commanded Christian slaves to obey their masters and please them in all things, doesn't that make them the servant of some man, whether that person be good or evil? In Philippians 1.18, Paul doesn't seem to care what motivation anyone would have for preaching Christ, and that certainly would affect the quality of the message, wouldn't it? But in Galatians 1, 8 through 9, Paul curses anybody whose message differs from his own. So how did Jesus feel about other religious groups? In Mark 9, 38 through 40, Jesus' disciples tried to stop certain people who were casting out devils in Jesus' name even though they weren't part of the disciples' group. Jesus told his disciples to leave them alone because no one who works miracles in Jesus' name can speak lightly or evil of him. Jesus said that those who are not against him are for him. The Bible, especially the Old Testament, enthusiastically endorses capital punishment carried out by imperfect human beings who are sinners themselves. But I found no laws compensating the widows and orphans of men unjustly convicted and executed, then later found to be innocent. The Old Testament had a double standard for men and women. Men did not get stoned to death for being a non-virgin before marriage, but a woman was assumed guilty of premarital unchastity if they could not find her honeymoon bedsheets to prove her innocence. In Deuteronomy 22, death by stoning is commanded for rape victims who didn't scream for help. But what if her assailant held a knife to her throat while committing the act? Throughout the Old Testament especially, Far higher moral standards seem to be demanded for women than for men, although Peter says women are weaker than men. 2 Peter 2.7 refers to Lot as a righteous man, but in Genesis 19, Lot offers to throw out his two virgin daughters to a mob of sex-crazed perverts in order to protect angels who are visiting his home. Not all the Bible is suitable spiritual food for Christians. You try to ingest it and meditate on it, and it it would only give you indigestion inside. And it isn't suitable for reading to children at bedtime. For example, the account in Genesis of Lot siring his own grandchildren or certain methods of birth control that was used that made God angry. And another story in Numbers chapter 5 of a uh, ritual curse carried out by a priest upon this woman suspected of straying against her husband. He made her drink cursed water, and if she was guilty, certain parts of her body would rot. I mean... There was no equivalent test for a straying husband. Leviticus 19.20 commands that if an engaged slave girl has sex with someone else, she must be whipped. But the guilty man simply brings the correct sacrifice to the altar to atone for his sin, and that's all there is to it. I'd say he got a better bargain than the defenseless slave girl. In numerous passages, the Old Testament sanctions the forced marriage of captive virgins, the sale of daughters into sexual slavery, and the wholesale 
slaughter of men, non-virgin women, and babies of other nations. How does this square with the gentle nature of the Christ of the New Testament, who said he came not to destroy men's lives, but to save them? How does it gel with this scripture? Psalms 145 verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. If Jesus would never approve of modern wars of conquest, why is Joshua's extermination of the Canaanites commended as an act of faith in Hebrews 11? Is this an example of faith for modern Christians to follow? It hardly takes much bravery for trained commandos to wipe out women and children. Even breastfed babies were butchered. These people were just going about the daily business of living when Joshua's forces launched their shock and awe campaign on them. More contradictions from the Apostle Paul. In Galatians 3.28, Paul says, All believers are one in Christ Jesus, and there is neither male nor female. In 1 Corinthians 11.5, Paul allows women to pray or prophesy in church. But in 1 Corinthians 14.34, Paul says, Let the women keep quiet in church. Now, unless the women use sign language, how in the world can they pray or prophesy without opening their mouth? In Acts 16.3, Paul circumcised Timothy to keep the peace with his Jewish brethren. But he didn't think it was okay to circumcise Titus in Galatians 2.3. Paul circumcised Timothy even though Paul warned that anyone who was circumcised is a debtor to keep the whole Mosaic law, Galatians 5.3. In Acts 21, even after Paul became a Christian, Paul participated in a Mosaic temple ritual. Strangely, Paul said he never gave in even one hour to the demands of the Judaizers, Galatians 2.5. In 2 Samuel 24.13, God offers David a choice of punishments, one of which is seven years of famine. But a parallel verse in 1 Chronicles 21.12 has God offering David just three years of famine to punish him for the same sin. Did God give David a discount? Exactly what sin brought about David's need to be punished? First Chronicles 21.1 says Satan was the one who tempted David to conduct a national census of Israel, while Second Samuel 24.1 claims that God provoked David to do it because he was angry at the nation of Israel and wanted an excuse to pour out his judgment. So David, caught in the middle, is the one who gets blamed and punished for serving God's purpose after either God or Satan tempted him to take the census. Can it get any stranger, especially when James 1.13 says God tempts no man? Why should the one who gives in to temptation be held more liable than the one who tempted him? These examples are just a few of countless examples of contradictions which I find puzzling in light of the fact the Bible a compilation of 66 documents penned over many centuries in many different locations by many men and whose inclusion in the canon of scripture was hotly debated by church councils in the Middle Ages is said to be God's own perfect and errant word. There are many stories, especially in the Old Testament, which are so bloody and X-rated, I would advise against any impressionable child reading them. Perhaps the most perplexing difficulty of all is Jesus' clear statement in Mark 13.30 that his own generation would not pass away before he fulfilled all the things he prophesied of his coming, and that includes his coming in great power and glory. In verse 26, Nearly 2,000 years have gone by, and everyone who was present when he first uttered 
those words has long died. Jesus still hasn't come back. God is not the author of confusion, but a wrong use or understanding of the Bible has created a lot of problems throughout history. You take this simple-minded yodel who has never gone to divinity school to learn how to correctly split hairs in theological interpretation of the Bible and tell him that he is to take the Bible at face value and literally apply every word to his life. Well, what if he goes out hunting for rattlesnakes and picks them up thinking, well, the Bible promised I wouldn't be hurt by these snakes and he ends up in the emergency ward and dies. A lot of children have died because their parents refused to get medical care because they thought prayer and faith were enough. When you have to split hairs and superanalyze and try to force a square peg into a round hole and twist everything and jump through hoops to get the contradictions to harmonize, there's something wrong. Now, the biggest problem, I think, is this works versus faith dilemma. Now, Paul, throughout his epistle, teaches salvation is by grace through faith. And that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And if you obtain your salvation through works, it is no longer by grace, but it is wages for works. But James teaches that faith without works is dead. So he seems to think no works, no salvation. And James version of how to get your salvation seems a little bit more like wages than the gift of God because you don't have to work to receive a gift or it is no longer a gift as Paul says. Whatever you find in the Bible which is consistent with the divinely revealed nature of Jesus Christ that is God's word to you and your spiritual food. Thanks for listening. Thank you.